All right, I think we can get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to subscription. Licensing is becoming the new normal, and what does it mean for you? Uh, hey, I'm Deb Summers here from TALIS, and I'm happy to be here today and host this webinar. And as I was saying earlier, if you guys need anything at all, you've got to find that little chat area on the right hand side of your screen. This is where you can type in a question during the webinar and uh, we'll make sure that every question gets answered. We're going to have some time at the end of the presentation where we can answer some written questions live if we can't take care of them all in the chat. So. If everyone is caffeinated and ready to go, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator and director of product marketing, Ms. Rachel Present Schrader. Thanks, Deb. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're going to go ahead and we're going to go through the agenda just to let you know what is going to be happening uh, today in our webinar. Um, we're going to start out with some introductions to our panelists in just a minute. We have a couple of great folks with us today to share their insights. Then we're going to discuss 2020 and the tremendous shifts that have happened really across the board uh, and the impact of those shifts, including on uh, vendors in different regards, in, including organizationally, uh, how it's impacting revenue and how revenue shifts with the subscription model that we're talking about today as well as how it impacts buyer expectations, which also shift when you move to a subscription or recurring revenue model. We'll discuss the impact on the business as a whole of moving to subscription, and then we're gonna get into the practical and our panelists will take you through a couple of case studies to, to discuss how our Talis, some of our Talis Sentinel customers have been able to successfully make this shift and what that's looked like for them. We're then gonna conclude with our top seven tips for success in this transition and share with you another upcoming webinar that we have on this topic. And we will leave some time for questions and answers. So with that, I will introduce our panelists for today. Today we have with us Darim Ramatala and Manoj Tharakan. Um, Darim is a senior product manager here at Talis Software Monetization. He has been with us for a long time and has tremendous experience with software licensing, uh, has done it in a bunch of different roles. And he's really focused on driving our product strategy um, and helping us to engage customers as they move forward through their journeys. Uh, Darim almost started his career as a professional musician. I think we're all very glad that he picked software licensing instead. And he is a do-it-yourself addict who recently redid what used to be a shed into something that is definitely no longer a shed. Uh, Durham is based in the UK. We also have with us uh, Manoj, who is a director of professional services here at Talis. Manoj focuses on working with some of our largest enterprise customers, and he comes to that role having done it himself from the other side of things, uh, where he worked within a, a very large company managing all of their entitlements and working with them both in cloud and uh, traditional software products. Uh, he has a really tremendous understanding of the shift to subscription that's happening, and I'm sure his insights will be very helpful to us. He enjoys travel and craft beer and apparently is looking forward to uh, his 1,000th unique beer, which he logs in an app called Untapped. So that's just a little bit about um, these two gentlemen. And um, from there, we're going to go ahead and get straight into our discussion today. So uh, gentlemen, obviously 2020 has been truly a unique year, and I'm hoping that we could start with your talking us through some of the changes that you've seen and experienced this year and, and how you feel those are really being reflected in the licensing space. Sure. Um, so, hey, everybody. Um, nice to uh, to see everyone here. Um, so, yeah, so I think, Rachel, from from my perspective, and to, to me, the first real big indicator um, was when we started seeing some major declines taking place in, uh, you know, in, in big B2B companies. Uh, and I'm talking about big household names like Cisco and, and HP. Um, it left a lot of folks unsure of, of what was going to be lying ahead for them. Um, we were seeing that these companies, they were taking, you know, 
big projects, you know, large projects like um, ERP rollouts, you know, big sort of capital expenditures are all being put in hold. They're even being cancelled altogether. Um, and it's it's really led to a you know a major shift in these companies pushing more of their costs into the um, the operational side of the business and moving out of that classic sort of capex model and much more into the uh, the good old opex models. I know Manoj is uh, is keen to add yeah. some of his own insights here as well. Right? Sure. Thanks, Jerem, and hi everyone. Um, so um, happy to be here. Just talking about what what other things we're seeing. Right, one of the big trends we're seeing is almost every one of our customers is coming back to us and asking us, "Hey, by the way, we have this on-premise software, and our management is putting a lot of pressure on us to get a SaaS offering." And that's, I think, a, a direct reflection of the pandemic, where the SaaS kind of deployment mode is is extremely popular. Um, the other trend we're seeing is. Um, Believe it or not, we still do have a lot of customers that physically deliver software. I think the pandemic has definitely put a emphasis of an end to that, a big shift towards uh, virtual delivery, electronic software delivery. Uh, lots of lots of our customers are now who are not ESD customers coming to us now with uh, saying, "Hey, we want to turn on electronic software delivery as well." So I think this is probably the year where we could probably write the obituary of physical software delivery, um, definitely accelerated by the pandemic. Uh, but again, if you had to basically net it out to a business model shift, I think the biggest shift we're seeing in terms of business models is customers, out of three, at least three out of four customers come to us around increasing revenue streams. And the biggest revenue stream that all of them are talking about is the, the subscription business model. Um, with that, uh, next slide, please, sir, Rachel. Sure, Manoj, it, it sounds like it's a really significant shift that you're seeing happening over the course of 2020, which I think is not a surprise to anybody. But I'm wondering if you can tell us how you feel this shift is being reflected in uh, technology companies, both within the IoT space specifically, as well as for software vendors in general. Sure, I'll, uh, Dharam, I'll let you take the IoT uh, question. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I think it's in IoT as well as in, in traditional software, right? They've they've had a very uh, the traditional approach is is you know you're selling a very large, expensive item up front. Um, it's a full featured package, right? It's it's essentially a you know it's the concept of landing the whale. That's really how the how the how the the, the the business was organized how the sales focus was was directed right it was all about getting a uh, um getting that big customer win the big primary event was 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 sealing that deal getting the customer contract and then essentially moving on moving on to the next um project you know the next sales win uh, so psychologically from a resource perspective once the once the customer's been uh, landed, for want of a better word, the um, you know the company would move on to the to the next engagement, and subscriptions has has completely changed this. Right, this is well, this is probably one of the most tangible differences, because with a subscription you need to be continually nourishing the customer. Right? There's no there's no more a concept of of winning the customer, and then you know once they've bought everything that they need, they're good to go, and everything else. That customer engagement has to be continually nourished and fed. Um, you know, the, 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 the goal is no longer about winning the customer in the first place. It's about keeping that customer as a subscribed and engaged customer. And that's really the big difference between uh, uh, subscriptions and, uh, and the good old sort of perpetual models, especially that the hardware companies that were were using. Right. And, and then just to add on to that, right, what one of the impacts of that is is really organization structures. Um, <clears throat> traditionally, we've seen hardware focused or more supply chain focused organizations having a very traditional kind of an organization structure, right? Where customer support and supply chain and IT and all of them are very separate functions. We're beginning to see new organizations getting formed, right? Uh, a new organization like customer success. Again, aligning in terms of how the customer would use the product. Right, so that you basically can go back and, as Durham said, continuously nourish the customer. So we're definitely seeing that shift within our our customers in terms of how they organize themselves to 
to help their customers being uh, be successful. Um, and not last but not least, I mean, the biggest source of revenue in this kind of a model is your existing customers, right? Uh, and according to a recent survey by CFO.com, uh, at least 40% of the revenue for companies that have adopted subscriptions come from a recurring revenue stream. And that's a number that's that's growing quickly as we'll, uh, we'll talk about in a few slides from now. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing those insights. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you see the impact of this transition on revenue, because moving to a customer success model is obviously a, a major shift kind of across the organization. And I'm wondering if you can talk about the bottom line here. Sure. Yeah. So I think you've traditionally seen, I mean, we've all been part of large projects, right? You buy, buy expensive software the integration kills a project, it ends up being shelfware. I think customers now no longer want to basically buy in that mode, right? They don't want to have shelfware projects, it's just too expensive for them. Um, so now as an ISV, it's, uh, as a vendor, you are fully invested in making sure that your software does not end up as shelfware. The direct impact of, of software basically being shelfware is that you will not, you will basically not have a renewal, right? So table stakes really in this model is to ensure that your your customers uh, will basically stay recurring customers and you don't have any kind of risk on your renewals, right? So it's really about having an all-in approach to making sure that the customers are deriving value from your, your subscription offer. And Durham, you might wanna just talk about some of the hard metrics around uh, revenue. Yeah, there's a there's a great statistic from McKinsey that that I like. Um, you know, they've estimated that companies that move to a subscription, you know, they're seeing a, at a minimum a 20% increase, and more typically up to a 50% increase in in revenue just from moving to a, a subscription-based uh, uh, model. Um, this is real money on the table, right? I mean, when when you factor in how much more expensive it is to to acquire a new customer compared to upselling to an existing one. Um, you know, it's no wonder that there's we're seeing so much more emphasis being put on 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 this nourishment, right? That we talked about, you know, reducing the customer churn and and keeping those uh, those existing customers engaged and and uh, you know um, advocates. You raised some great points, Durham. And if we could get the next slide, um, I think that we we we've seen and you've discussed the impact of this shift to recurring revenue that it and the the uh, difference that that can make in organizations and the changes that they need to make. But I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about the benefits of this transition. It's clearly a lot of work to uh, build this customer success function and to uh, move to focusing more on your existing customers. Is it worth it? It, it sounds like it's, it's sort of a lot of work. What's, what's the benefit um, across the organization? Yeah, it's a it's a really really important question, right? And and I think if you if I was to summarize it in one sentence, it's all about make predictable revenue streams. Um, the, in the current climate, you know the, the the financial uncertainty, it's even more relevant. Um, you know, having a predictable revenue stream gives you you know revenue stability, and revenue stability uh, it fuels confidence in the business. Um, and that fuels the, the the willingness and the appetite for reinvesting back into the business. Um, and this, you know, again, you know, related to the the current climate, having these constant streams of revenue, it makes the impact of a quiet quarter or a quiet half of a year, you know, especially from the perspective of of the acquisition of new logos. Right? If you, the impact of a of a of a downturn in that kind of activity is is far less severe. It really softens the blow when you've got these, um, you know, a, a, a good a good number of customers that are on, you know, subscribed customers that are that are giving you these uh, these streams of uh, renewing recurring revenue. Manoj, would yeah, you would you concur with that? Absolutely right. Uh, Durham's absolutely right, and I think the natural evolution of this is these. Uh, B2B businesses are really evolving from just selling components, products, and parts to intertwining themselves to the entire product life cycle. So you're going to see a lot of these 
first you land and then but there's lots of expansion opportunities that that companies look for as well in uh, in these subscription offers Great. Manoj, could you tell us a little bit about how this shift impacts the buyer's expectations? We've talked a lot about, from the vendor perspective, how this is going to look, but but how does this change what, what's being asked of vendors? Yeah, sure. This is an important question, right? So this really comes down to the go-to-market, right? Buyers, different buyers have different expectations, right? Um, I think we've seen most of our customers not just offering one model, but offering a variety of subscription models. Um, on on one, probably the most common one is just a fixed subscription, three-year term um, with a standard package. But there's different packaging, like perhaps a good, better, best packaging, right? Uh, but, and also, if you want to talk about extremes, you have customers wanting to basically pay by usage, buy, pay by the drink. Um, and then some of our more evolved enterprises, especially ones that have large number of product suites or different, like, like if it's a security product, they tend to have lots of security products in, in a suite. Uh, they're actually trying to push towards an all you can eat buffet kind of model where they want to sell an enterprise license agreement to their customers. Now this is the enterprise license agreement is a, a really cool license license model for some of the bigger enterprises because not only is it a much is it a much bigger revenue uh, revenue a recurring revenue stream but it's also a very sticky way of basically selling products across the portfolio and so maybe even if you have a product that may not be a market leader it might be a good way to basically provide a tremendous uh, value to your customers by bundling all of them into an enterprise license agreement. And we're seeing some of our larger enterprises talking to us about uh, about ELAs. Um, and of course, uh, all of this is really coming from the consumerization of B2B, right? This, this is what all of us kind of expect when we buy in a consumer world, right? Like for example, our cars are pay as you go, you can buy your gym subscriptions, things like that. You can buy a family subscription. It's kind of modeled around those, right? And B2B is definitely getting a lot of that buying flexibility that consumers have. Uh, the ISV's customers are asking for that. Right? And, and perhaps Durham, uh, we are, a, we are a, a SaaS company ourselves, right? And then you wear a product management hat. Uh, can you share a little bit about our own internal story uh, within Talus on, on how we've evolved in terms of this product management rollout? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so we, we, we were very much, you know, the, the taking the traditional approach. You know, I was I've been here long enough to uh, to remember those days and we were we were doing big fat, you know, feature rich releases every year, every year and a half. And it was it was a you know, it was a it was definitely a uh, it was a it was it was a big, big team push to get us over the line. And that, you know, crossing that line was always a very slow process could sometimes take a month or two just to go, you know, just to do the final stages of getting the release out to the market, the big old classic sort of waterfall type approach. Um, and we transitioned to a, you know, this, this, this incremental, you know, the, 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 um, the concept of just releasing far more frequently uh, once a month, in some cases, even sometimes, you know, once every couple of weeks with the, uh, um, with releases, and I think this is really, really important when you're when you have subscription customers because you want to keep keep a steady flow, right, of innovation and a steady flow of value to them. Um, but just from our own experiences, it it really helped us internally. You know, we've we found some some great new efficiencies in our engineering processes, um, in how re, in how product roadmaps were were created. You know, it, we didn't expect to see as much internal benefit. Um, compared to the external benefit that we were anticipating. Let's move to the... Uh, a little bit about how you've seen um, the the impact of this in terms of um, sort of the, the different models that are offered or the, the great levels of um, the types of offerings that you've seen, just a little bit more in terms of the purchase flexibility that's being demanded. Yeah, so I touched a little bit about that, right? So you want to offer a... a variety of, of buying models, right? As I said, uh, 
pay by the drink, right? All you can eat ELAs, right? Um, some customers uh, probably want to do this in a prepaid mode. Some of them probably in a postpaid mode, right? Um, and then in terms of packaging, right? I think a very traditional packaging we've seen is subscriptions offered in 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 tiers of capabilities like good, better, best, right? Um, that's a very popular kind of packaging that we've seen uh, product managers evolve to. Um, and also, I think one of the other big trends is especially when you're trying to acquire new customers having a trial and freemium model right um, allowing customers to enter at a low end trial it uh, and then convert it possibly at a low end and then once they derive value out of this of, out of the subscription uh, very often maybe um, upgrading themselves to a higher 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 offer right maybe more seats in terms of licenses or more features uh, whatever the case may be in terms of how your product is packaged uh, so we're seeing a lot of, of those kinds of queries we're seeing a lot of our customers adopting these kinds of uh, product of flexible uh, buying patterns for their for their customers Great, I think if we could get to the next slide, Deb. I'm wondering if you guys can talk a little bit about the changes on sort of this higher organizational level, the impact that this will have on RevRec um, in particular and on sort of the operational end of things. Sure. Would you like to begin? Yeah, I will. Right, so I think um, most of you might be aware there are new uh, financial regulations, the ESC 606, right, which basically talks about how revenue can be, can be recognized in the subscription world. There's some pretty uh, strict guidelines around uh, uh, how services have to be recognized, how products have to be recognized. So definitely something that you want to talk with your finance team as you roll out your um, your uh, your subscription offers in terms of just operational efficiency right again it's it's really about uh two things right it's it's about making sure that you reduce the internal red tape right you might have had an organization structure that worked well in uh in the business models of the past breaking down some of those barriers to make sure that it's a lot more customer centric and a lot more customer focused um, again the goal being this ongoing value delivery for the customers, right? Because you want them to to have that renewal event, um, and and then of course all of this is is not possible without a pretty compli complicated ecosystem of business systems, right? Um, usually customers say there's a lot of duct tape and 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 wires in our in our ecosystem. Again, look for companies that offer easy integrations, right? Look for services based integrations look for companies that offer connectors that help you integrate easily to, to other business systems. Um, I think the automation is a is a key part uh, to basically enabling success in this business model. And also I should make a point that your traditional supply chain business models, your business systems have been replaced right now. You can no longer run with just an ERP system, right? You probably need an identity management system. You probably need a billing system. And of course you probably uh, definitely need an entitlement management system to go with with all of this um, in your in your back office. Uh, Durham, your thoughts? Yeah, I I think there's 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 some more to say on the automation side of things for sure, right? And um, the you know the nature of of a subscription or a recurring revenue business, it's 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 very kind of cyclical in nature. It's it it's a, it's a repeating transaction. Um, and this is something that drives the need to have as much as much automation and streamlining as possible. You know, so your your order processing should be fully automated. Your your system to system interactions, um, like Manoj says, that there's more systems that come into the picture, billing systems that you may not be, you know, subscription management systems, entitlement management systems. Um, so they they need to be talking to each other. They need to be communicating and. And the less manual interaction, you know, if you can eliminate the manual interactions completely, then you've, then you've, you've, you've succeeded for sure. Um, but it's really is important to to uh, to make sure that these transactions are as as frictionless as possible because they're just they're much there's much more of them happening. The frequency of these transactions is is dramatically higher compared to the uh, you know the the, the one shot uh, perpetual deals where you where you sell at the at the front and then that's it. Um, 
also moving on to you know thinking about becoming more data data centric right becoming much more data orientated um, the nature of a, of a of a subscription model is that you you will have more interaction with the customer um, you're going to be you know th there's going to be renewals there's going to be far more opportunity to uh to, to 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 shake hands with that customer so to speak and this is really where it serves you well to to, to embracing the uh data that you can respond that you can get back from it you know telematics on how the applications are being used and where they're being used and and, and you know you can even start measuring engagement levels of the customer through this data as well right and it's it's all about you know responding and adjusting based on on what you're learning um, and again this is it's much more feasible it's much more in your hands when you've got a, a a subscription based model like i said because you've got that that repeating cycle of interaction that's taking place absolutely uh could we get to the next slide please um now that we've spoken and made some really interesting points about sort of how this looks on almost a theoretical level i'd like us to to drill down a little bit into the the more practical and see what this transition has looked like for some of our customers. So, um, Darim, I'd like to ask if you would discuss our Candela case study and take us through that. Um, and then, Manoj, if you would take us, please, through the Extreme Networks case study and just share with us, you know, what making this shift has really looked like for these two specific companies as opposed to the sort of general discussion that we've been having. Yeah, sure. Sure thing, Rachel. So. So Candela, um, I, I think this is a great story that they that they, they told us about, right? So they're they're a medical device manufacturer. They they specialize in aesthetics. Um, they do things like um, uh, scar treatment, uh, scar tissue treatment, um, fat fat tissue removal, um, tattoo removal, that kind of stuff. They're they're in the, that sort of side of the, the medical industry. Um, they have a, a groundbreaking product. Um, it's a fat reduction therapy that uses infrared pulses, so it's it's completely non-invasive. Um, it's an incredibly successful um, product uh, that 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 is you know widely used across the world. And it's they used to offer this on a in a traditional manner, so it's basically a one-time upfront cost. You know your classic kind of hardware-based um, offering, really. You know, so one up upfront cost, big big fee for the equipment. Um, and they didn't really have any other any notion of a recurring revenue. But the only thing they did have was that there were some consumables on these devices. There were um, these transducers or the sort of the tips of the of of the uh, the the, um, the 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 scanner, the device. And um, these transducers would would wear out over time. Um, so they were basically a consumable uh, product, com consumable piece to the to the solution. And uh, customers would have to replace them so they would charge for these transducers over time you know as the more the, the more the machines are being used the more transducers these customers are having to buy so that was their only notion of a of a repeating kind of revenue based on this on this hardware um so they switched they switched completely to a recurring revenue model they um they actually utilized a, a paper click or paper use it was actually you know more accurate a paper pulse mechanism um they would sell to their customers a number of pulses so they would say like say they would sell a batch of 300 pulses or 500 pulses pulses that the customer would purchase um, and then depending on the treatment they would consume these pulses at different rates so you know a fat reduction on the thigh might use up 20 pulses and maybe there's three different treatments for the patient to be you know to complete the course and stuff like that so so just depend on the on the nature of the treatment there would be different you know different amounts of these pulses consumed um, their customers, the, the clinics, could uh, they could log into um, a portal and they could see how many pulses they had there. This was a great. This was something completely new to to the medical to these to these to these clinics to have this kind of self service capability. But they could go into a portal. They could see how many pulses they had left, how many they'd consumed. Um, they could they could addition, they could top up the pulses if they needed needed to. But they they just it gave them complete foresight on on how many treatments they had left. Before they had to purchase uh, purchase something else and purchase something new, um, this had a it actually had a, a something that that's not mentioned here is that it actually had an additional benefit for the clinics themselves because they knew exactly just from a pricing perspective some of these private clinics that would pay that would charge patients for these procedures 
um, it made their pricing so much simpler because they knew exactly how many um, pulses a certain treatment would be using and they knew exactly how much one pulse was going to cost them so it was so so much easy so much easier for them to come up with a reliable pricing structure for their for their own patients um, probably the biggest competitive advantage that they had was that these consumables these these uh, transducers they could basically take away the the pricing for those they made them free of charge um, and it meant that and this really gave a big a, a massive advantage because especially in the medical industry it's a, it's always a given that you're going to be paying extra for consumables um, and replaceable components you know sometimes they're just replaceable for a hygiene perspective sometimes they're replaceable because they wear out but it's it's just if you're a if you're a customer uh, in the medical industry this is this is fairly much a common scenario so they could really change their own um, market position by saying we're no longer going to charge for this and they could do that because they had that 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 revenue stability from coming from the, the uh, recurring streams right so they had that ability that uh, that freedom and that flexibility to 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 basically get a little bit more creative with their uh, with their pricing um, it, the result was their revenue went up dramatically. You know, they saw an over over 170 percent increase in their average customer revenue from from doing this. And that was without without changing their technology. This was purely a benefit from changing the way they price and uh, and offer their product. Okay, Manoj, do you want to uh, talk about um, extreme networks? Sure, Deb. Let's advance to the next slide, please. All right, so Extreme Networks. Um, this is a company based out of uh, the Silicon Valley. Uh, it's a company obviously in the networking industry, but they've been growing through acquisitions, right? They've acquired a whole bunch of companies, uh, Brocade and Aerohive and a whole slew of, of companies were acquired by this umbrella called, called Extreme Networks. Um, <clears throat> so when they came to us, right, they basically came to us for two things, right? They, so they had, as a result of all these acquisitions, they had many business systems and many enforcement technologies um, that they had in their in their organization, and they wanted to standardize uh, both the both the back office as well as on a single enforcement technology. So that is one driver, and the second driver, of course, was to adapt to new business models like subscriptions. Um, this was a company that traditionally sold a lot of perpetual licenses, uh, but again, they they had the pressure to move to more predictable recurring revenue streams. So one of the big drivers again was to move to the subscription business model. But I think one thing that Extreme did really well was not only did they move to subscriptions as a business model, their product management team took it a step further. They basically introduced a form of a license currency. So they basically call it tokens. So irrespective of what extreme product you buy, you just buy a bunch of tokens that can be deployed on any product, whether it's a SaaS product, whether it's an on-premise product, and then you can basically use these tokens and once you're done using the token on a, on a particular device, you can return the tokens back and then redeploy them. So they gave a almost frictionless buying experience in terms of not having this confusion of what SKU should I order? And then they had the flexibility in the back office to basically have different products associated with different token counts. So that way product managers also had flexibility saying that, why well, can't give that away for one token? Mine's a higher value software, I need a, a different token value. So, so it was a win-win for both a customer perspective in terms of ease of buying, as well as a product management perspective in terms of flexibility of offer definition. Now, in terms of where they uh, are, with us right so they basically selected our sentinel ems as their licensing back office platform of choice and they are in the in the process of rolling out our enforcement technology sentinel rms across their product lines and of course that's a journey but we're beginning to onboard one product after the another after another on the on the enforcement side um, they're also talking to us about newer business models and again this has been this, this journey is, is expected to be, we're, we're going to be partnering with them for a long time through the subscription journey. And Rachel, back to you. Thanks, Manoj. Uh, I want to really thank you both for the the points that you've raid, raised in the, in the case studies that you've shared. I think it's really helped to um, understand 
the the shift that's happening and the benefits that it can bring to potentially some of the folks who are on this webinar. Um, as we're getting ready to wrap up, knowing that everyone's time is valuable, um, I believe that we've put together a few points that we wanted to share with our audience. Deb, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, just to talk about kind of our key takeaways for successfully transitioning to subscription. So, uh, Durham, I will turn it over to you to start us out. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, I think the, the the first point is a really, really important one. Um, just ensuring that there's a, there's consistency. Um, you know, like Manoj says with, with Extreme, this was uh, this was a really important point to bring together technology. So it's it's it, there's many facets to this point. It's it's bringing together the technology that you use for licensing. It's bringing together the systems you use for for deploying the licenses, license generators, and entitlement delivery systems and provisioning systems. Um, but it also talk, you know, it talks to concepts like making sure that your pricing has as much um, commonality as possible. Your product ordering flows have as much commonality as possible. Uh, this is really important because it's, it's a subscription business, a recurring revenue business is by its nature is going to be more complex from you know from many perspectives because it's 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 cycling it's a it's a repeating um, process so you want to make sure that you 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 have this nailed from a from a commonality and a consistency perspective it really really helps um, you also want to be deciding your your deployment or your rollout strategy up front um, and this is this is going to be dependent on the the nature of your business for sure right and it's you know, there's really two choices. Do you do it all at once? You know, do you transition your entire business to a recurring revenue model, or, or do you do this incrementally? Is it done on a per product basis? It, is it done on a per customer basis in some cases, or even a, a regional basis? I mean, there's there's so many factors that determine that, that that you use to determine this: the nature of your customers, the nature of your product release cycles, how often do customers stay on one version of this? There's there's a lot of different factors that will determine this, but you do need to decide on that strategy, um, plan it out, and make sure that you go into this with that strategy well defined and, and agreed. Um, the third point is, is, it can be a slightly contentious one because we've seen projects fail um, when they haven't had a dedicated uh, sort of sense of ownership or focus on software licensing, software operations, uh, entitlement, production so everything that's related to enabling products with end customers that whole sort of sequence of events that takes place there needs to be ownership here um, if it's if it's um if it's basically a secondary task from a from your operations team or, or your development team or your product management team right if these are secondary activities then they're not going to get executed properly and they won't be executed with the with a complete kind of uh, appreciation of all of the constraints and all of the uh, the challenges that different departments have, so this has to be something that can cross cross that chasm, talk to different departments, and and understand how software operations, what it even means to different um, departments, and this is what that's really really all about. Um, and then the alignment is uh, we've talked about this in a with a couple of examples already, you know, making sure that your, the organization is all on the same page because it means something different to everybody. Sales will, you know, will, will, have, to, will have to implement some behavioral changes, right? There's, they're going from the, hunty, the hunter to the, uh, the farming um, strategy, you know, but even down to things like how, how your salespeople will be compensated will be, will be affected here. Um, you know, we also talked about product managers, right? The, the product release strategy needs to change. The engineering processes uh, will need to be impact, you know, will be impacted to to come up with a more incremental approach to to delivering that value out to the uh, to the market. And Manoj, you and I were talking about another one. You had a you had a great one on this one as well. Yeah. So I think just 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 keeping the theme of organizations, right? It's it's also your marketing organization, right? Now your marketing message needs to change. Um, it's no longer about the one-time sale and all the features in your product. Right? That's important, right? But you also want to basically show the incremental value that your your engineering teams are delivering, right? Your marketing messages need to hone in on that. Uh, your customer support team, right? Um, your customer support 
often becomes an extension of your customer success team, right? So ha making sure that they're all well trained in, in software operations and those kinds of use cases um, become extremely important. Um, just continuing on onto the next point, right? Again, it's as you as you align your organizations, you have to define your processes, right? It's going to be different from your your perpetual mode. It's going to be different from how you did business. Uh, just defining your your end-to-end -end policies and processes, right? Uh, just things like what is your policy around when subscriptions expire? Do you basically allow products to go and reduce functionality? Do you want to be more draconian? stop all functionality. These are all uh, key decisions that you have to make in terms of policies for your organization. And then especially if you, and just moving to the next one, right? A governance structure is super critical. Uh, I've been part of many organizations where there's always a business unit that has to be different, right? They'll come in and say, yeah, that works for them, but we are different, right? And you're always pushed by your business units uh, wanting to be the exception. Uh, our recommendation is have a governance structure, uh, evolve your governance structure. If your business units are truly uh, coming up with new things, evolve it, but uh, please don't uh, give in to an exception because once the exception happens, it's gonna be the next business unit that's gonna ask for that, right? So evolve your governance structure, but make sure you have it. And last but not least, please do not underestimate the uh, impact and the need for field change management. Uh, use every uh, tool that you have. Uh, it could be your customer conferences. It could be just your advertising. It could be just the uh, the swag you give away for your customers. Right? Use every opportunity to basically communicate how you're changing your business, how you're changing your models. Um, this is super important. Um, the communication part of of getting the message out and showing that you're delivering incremental value for your customers. Is, is super important to make sure that uh, these kinds of business shifts are successful for your organization. And back to you, Rachel. Perfect, thank you guys. That was very interesting and um, made a lot of sense. Uh, Deb, if we could get the last uh, slide. Uh, we just wanted to mention to all of you, uh, we're seeing from the number of questions coming in and the interest in this webinar, that it seems like this is a topic that's really resonating with folks. So we did want to share with you that in a few weeks, we have another webinar coming up that we'll be doing with Zora, who is our partner. Um, and it's going to be about achieving subscription licensing success. So if you're interested, um, hang tight and we will, we will have another webinar. Um, we do have a bunch of questions, which we are monitoring in the chat window. You're welcome to, um, to, to put your questions in there. And we will try our best to get to as many questions as possible. Um, I want to just say in advance that I'm not sure that we will be able to get to all of the questions, but we will absolutely do our very best. So I am going to head it off by asking um, Darim, we got a question about monthly versus annual subscriptions. Can you address that one briefly? What What's better? Yeah, great question. I think there's the, the, there's no real answer to this, right? Both both are good. They, they just depend on, on the nature of the... Uh, of the products, most vendors these days prefer a a annual uh, approach to a subscription. It seems to be the best compromise between, um, you know, having a you know it, it it lines up with financial reporting and everything else, right? And if you've got a customer that's doing this every every you know that, that has their renewal date you know every month, then you've you've basically got a monthly uh, a monthly stream coming in anyway, right? Um, but it just, it depends, you know, on-premise software typically goes with longer subscription periods, cloud-based software, um, SaaS applications typically go with shorter periods. Uh, that's, that's the general rule. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it does, it does depend very much on, on the nature of the business and the nature of the product. And guys, Deb here, I'm going to hop in because we're getting lots of questions about the recording and the slides, and we will package that up for you and share it within a week's time. So just watch your email, check your spam folder, but yes, we will share everything with you. Great. Thank you, Deb. 
Um, Manoj, this is a great question, I think, for you. We have a question here about how to answer customers who are afraid of being forced into subscription models and who might be skeptical of this transition. Could you be able to talk a little bit about to, about that? Yeah, sure. So I think, yes, this is this is a change, right? So I think it goes back to some of the points we said, right? It's It's the onus on the ISV to prove that they can deliver value quickly, right? So the more things that you have in terms of automating your connections to your back office, that's definitely a big factor in, 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 in getting customers to value very quickly. And also, again, I think when you do these kinds of projects, you want to also phase things in, right? You want to run projects in phases with early releases so that you can, you can first demonstrate value and then second also making sure that you you're basically delivering things in 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 sizable in bite-sized chunks so you're not trying to solve every corner use case right so phasing is important right it, it some of these are a good trade-off conversations you need to have at uh, at the project initiation most of the successful projects that uh, we've been involved in has had customer stakeholders that were uh, very engaged in actually phasing projects and pushing uh, some of the non-essential uh, functions to a, a follow-on phase. So I'd say that those would be the strategies, automation and phasing. Thank you. I see that we have a couple of questions here that are on similar topics. So I'm going to um, ask them. Um, Darim, I'd like to ask you to jump in first and then Manoj uh, to, to add uh, if you feel that you... I, I've seen few questions where Manoj doesn't have added value to provide, so uh, I'll ask Darim to start off and then Manoj to jump in. Uh, one question we have is, have you seen companies be successful with both subscription and perpetual options? And there was also a question about um, uh, customers who have already purchased a perpetual license and how to transition them uh, if they've already bought a license. Um, do they need to pay a subscription fee now when they've already paid for a perpetual license at the beginning, and what strategy is suitable to engage those customers? Uh, yeah, they're great questions, actually. Um, let me go with the with the second question first. Um, so and Durham, we, we've I just also... want to jump in here quickly to just say we have time for this and probably one more question, and then we're going to have to wrap. So I apologize in sure. advance. Okay, great. Okay. I'll make it a good one. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we, we've seen this ourselves, right? It's, it's a big challenge is, is getting that timing right. When is the right time to, to move a customer over? Um, the most successful example of this that we've seen is with a major release. If you have a big, you know, you're going from a version 6.8 to 7.0 of your product, right? Whenever there's a major version shift, um, that is generally the best timing to, uh, to, to move a customer over to a, um, a perpetual uh, model and this, uh, sorry, a, a subscription model. And this is why, I, you know, back when I tied back to us talking about making sure that there's a lot of alignment within the organization, because, you know, you want to start building up the, the transition, the move, you know, but based on the development schedule and the, and the product release and the product roadmap plan. Um, but so, yeah, I think a major a major version change is is definitely proven to be the most successful point at which to uh, to do this transition. Um, uh, Manoj, anything else to add on that one from your side, or I'll I'll jump straight to the next one if we're running a little bit short. No, I think uh, I'll I'll just add that um, it's it's also having um, I mean if you want to actually make make this successful, right? There, you have to make some hard calls, right? At some point, you'll have to end of life some of your perpetual offers, right? Uh, there's always got to be a customer that has a, a a deal that they've signed for for very long, and those might be the exceptions. But you want to basically end of life some of your offers and then start moving your business to to subscriptions if that's that's the way you want to do it. Having said that, we do have a lot of customers that are are getting into subscriptions for probably like they probably have a base product, but they want to basically sell their analytics portion in a subscription. And that's really them just feeling out the business model. They still don't want to disrupt too much on their perpetual business because they feel that it's too big a shift to go from a perpetual model to subscription. So then they take probably the newer products, maybe an analytics piece or a network management piece, and then start offering those products in a subscription model first and then learn from those and then eventually evolve that evolve that to their core products. 
Thank you, Manoj. Thank you, Manoj. I want to um, address one last question. Um, and uh, as uh, bef just before we address the last question, I do want to point out that we are happy to answer additional questions. Um, and we have a bunch of folks like Darim and Manoj who are available to answer questions. So if you have additional questions, please feel free to email our sales team, um, which is SM, like software monetization, sales at talisgroup.com. Um, and we're happy to continue these discussions with uh, anyone or everyone in the future. This is you know, literally what we do. Um, so we're happy to continue. The last question that we're gonna be able to address today, uh, and apologies to anyone whose questions we didn't get to, is around the cost, uh, specifically the cost effectiveness of moving to a cloud slash subscription uh, software mechanism versus on-prem and perpetual, um, and whether this is cost effective. Um, so, Darim, could you start with with your answer to this, and then we can move to Manoj, and then we'll we'll wrap here. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, this is a really important question as well, right? It's um, so the the, the costs, it's a, it's a, it's a relative perspective because your costs are generally inherently lower with a cloud or SaaS based offering anyway, right? You you typically will have higher costs. Um, with a with a with an on-premise offering, so your savings will be more tangible um, with the on-premise offerings, and I think this is why we're seeing a lot more popularity, um, you know, for for people that, that deploy on-premise software, you know, that to, to basically mimic um, the, uh, the 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 behaviors of of SaaS vendors from this perspective. Um, but for sure, um, I think so. From that perspective, I would say that the cost savings are are higher um, with, uh, with on-premise deployments. Manoj, anything else to add on that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it from another angle as well. So I, I'm, if, if the question was more around, is the subscription model more expensive over time than a perpetual one? Uh, potentially, yes, right? Um, and you've probably seen this, the graphs, right? It's, uh, it's about a three-year term when the, the cross uh, the, the prices crossover right um but i think it's really about about that ongoing value right so long as you continue to provide ongoing features ongoing value in your product right and you're innovating your customers will be happy to, to stay in that subscription the biggest risk you have is when you stop innovating and you don't offer new features then your customers are going to question the value of the subscription and then they're probably going to shift to another vendor who probably has innovated and has offered more more capabilities, right? So that's one part. And then don't ever underestimate the the fact that you have to make your customer successful, right? So being all in on customer success, right? Making sure that you're invested in their success and them generating value and not letting your software be uh, be shelfware with your customers i think once customers see see those kinds of traits with the isv uh, they they'll be happy to stick with a subscription even if they could in the old world maybe a perpetual one over time would have been cheaper Okay, guys, I think that's a wrap. I want to thank everyone and great job, Rachel, Darim, and Manoj. Um, even I learned something today. So thank you so much. And hey, uh, for all the attendees, as I mentioned, watch your inbox within the week because uh, we will definitely share the link to the recording and the charts. Check that spam folder so that you don't miss it. And to everybody in the U.S., we want to wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving holiday next week. And we just want to say this team is really thankful for each and every one of you that did join today. Everybody stay safe um, and just have a great rest of your day. Thanks, team. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. And thanks a lot, Deb.